All right, so we're starting a new recording. Um, uh, the plan today, or the plan now, is to, oh, some more people wanted to come in. I think, I want to check the breakout rooms here. There are a handful of folks still in one of the breakout rooms. That's great. Um, apparently, when you leave, and when, when we first set folks up, uh, I just said, let everyone pick a breakout room. Um, and so you, you should be able to pick a breakout room if you haven't already, but it's not clear to me that people can change breakout rooms. So that means they're not going to work quite the way I had hoped that they would work. Um, uh, if you would like to get into a room and you can't, um, chat one of the, somebody who's listed as a co-host and we can assign you to a room. <laughs> and so I think that's the going to be the workaround solution. So if you're in a room and you, and you want to leave that room, you can always come back to the main session. If you would like to go into a room just with somebody else, just in my shoot a direct message to any of us listed as co-hosts and say, hey, move me to room two and we will move you to room two or room 12 or whatever room you wanna be in. And I think that will work. Um, uh, so again, you know, we're working on these as we go. So, all right, before we jump in then, any questions or thoughts that people have had a chance to reflect on as they were away and got a little bit of breakfast or more caffeine in them? All right, hearing none then, I'm going to share my screen. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, exploratory network analysis and visualization. So this is a, an area near and dear to my heart. I've spent a good deal of time, more hours than I care to admit, on uh, trying to make networks pretty. Um, and so it's useful to explain, to spend a minute to think about why you do this and what you do and where it goes. So I'll spend, you know, maybe 15 minutes or so just going over this at high level. And then we can jump in and have Q&A again about where we're at. I think the, um, the big picture issue here is that network visualization is usually the first step in exploratory network analysis. And um, that's actually true if you're dealing with ego networks or giant networks. It's often the case that if you wanna get a sense of what the, you know, what the social fabric, to use the phrase we used earlier today, um, is about, network visualizations can actually be a really nice way to get that if you know how to read them. <laughs> they are a little like tea leaves. And so you need to um, you know, you get some sense about what's driving them under the hood to make sense of what you're actually seeing. So, um, so what I'm gonna do next is go through a sequence of the, the basic ways in which network visualization works. And then um, we'll jump back and, and go to Q&A just so we have a bit of the same language amongst everyone. But again, um, don't be shy using the chats or using um, uh, or, or otherwise, you know, contacting one of us if you're jumping in if there's a question and we can stop as we go. Um, so the, the a, um, uh, it is a very basic field. There are, are a big field. There is an like there are literally like hundreds of papers, if not thousands of papers, on you know, new algorithms for for visualizing networks and. Um, so what I want to do is just talk through sort of a couple of the, the basic ways in which network analysis visualization is done. So um, the, the good part and bad part of it, I think, is kind of illustrated by these figures. If you look at these four figures um, uh, and then ask yourself, like, how they differ, you might say on the left, well, like, this is a clear example of hierarchy and inequality. And on the lower right there, you'd say, well, these are um, examples of everyone being equal to everyone else because it's just a big circle. And so, you know, in one case you have equality, in other case you have inequality. Of course, if you go through and actually trace the points and lines, you get the exact same underlying graph. So the point here is to note out that um, all of the different ways in which graph visualization happens mean something different. And your viewer is going to interpret something from the figure on the screen. And so you want to make sure that they interpret what you intend for them to interpret. And that means using these, um, uh, these tools smartly. Um, as a general rule, I think that there are sort of three pillars to the visualization stool. Um, and you want to make sure all of them are working simultaneously. Um, whatever visualization strategy you have, it's in service to some knowledge problem, some question you're trying to answer. And that answer to that question should be in service to um, the data that you've observed. And these things feed back on each other. So it's the case that um, you wanna make sure that the visualization you give is accurate, right? And that's what we try to do all the time in science is the last thing you wanna do is you know, lie to somebody um, or mislead them unintentionally. And so, the go so there is a, a core element of data fidelity, 
But if there's, it turns out if this little you know example I showed you here before, all of these things are showing the truth, none of them are lies per se, then what is it about the strategy that actually helps convey the part of the information you wanna work with? And the reason this is possible is because network data are multidimensional. And so when that, and, and with the visualization, you have two, maybe three dimensions to play with, um, even if you add color and size and such. So you always have to pick and choose. And as you pick and choose, that means you're gonna always throw some data away in service of being clear about some other parts of the data. Um, as a general rule, there are a couple of basic network um, types. The, the big division is between tree-based layouts and what we're going to call space-based or force-directed layouts. A tree-based layout um, or, or a, a vertical layout or a horizontal layout, um, the, the main thing about these layouts are that um, one of the axes of your two-dimensional space is reserved for some quantitative measurement indicator. So, it could be rank in the formal hierarchy. It could be your centrality. It could be your income, right? There's something about that vertical axis, or if you flip it on its side, the horizontal axis. But one of the axes is reserved for um, reflecting whatever that quantity is. Most of the time, it's a rank in the network itself. So in this case, you can see here, this is a formal organizational chart. You have a root at the base of that chart, which would be the CEO say, and you go to the presidents and the vice presidents and the vice vice presidents and managers and so forth. And these things are directed in layers of the formal hierarchy. A force-based layout on the other hand, the entire space is free to put a node in and, the, and vertical and horizontal are actually irrelevant. What matters in a force-based layout is that each node is adjacent to or close to nodes that it's connected to, um, and, or at least in an ideal world it is. And so um, the, the basic idea with a force-based layout, or for, they were also called spring and better, I'll use the same word, is, the, um, is that what you're trying to replicate on the screen is something very similar or very close to the social distance in the network itself. And so you're trying to make the display distance correlate with the underlying graph distance. So in this case, you can see that this node is one step from this node and this node and so forth. Now it turns out this is two measure, two versions of the exact same underlying data. So in this case, a hierarchy is a good layout. Um, it's good to use a tree-based layout for a hierarchy because in this case, the ordering is really the principle that's organizing the network. And that's what you want to convey and as it makes it, it clear. If, if you apply a force-based layout to what's really a directed tree, if you come over here and look, you can find the root. And so you can say, ah, oh, here's a node that has no arrows coming out of it or coming into it, excuse me. So that's the root of the tree. And I can say, well, here's the left branch and here's the right branch and I can see who, who's below it. But it's not immediately intuitive. You have to dig in and, and work at it. Um, on the flip side, I mean, what force-based layouts are really good at is identifying like clumps in the social structure and, and these kinds of cyclic cycles. And so in this case, you can see that the fact that you have all these closed triads, a friend of a friend is a friend. So all of those friends are gonna be put next to each other. And you can see that there are three distinct subgroups in this community. If I were to try to force some kind of tree-based layout on this community, it'll do it. It'll put the most central node at the top and the least central node at the bottom but it's pretty meaningless. And if I were to move a line here or there, it would change it and make it very different. So this is a pretty poor representation of what you want here. And just to back up quickly, the reason they're called force-based layouts is what they're literally doing is treating the algorithm under the hood is treating each connection between two nodes as a force that's pulled you together and every non-connection as a force that's pushing you apart. And so, what it's doing is equilibrating those sets of springs, a spring that pulls you together if you're connected and a spring that pushes you apart if you're disconnected. And if you then force that to exist in two dimensions, it will most of the time give you do a nice job of putting nodes that are close to each other, that have lots of ties to each other, that are close ne next to each other and ties that are not far apart. So this example that I've used to open a lot of my talks is one of the um, ad health schools and so here, right, you can see that the junior high kids are up here in the top, the high school kids are at the bottom, and these natural clusters are junior high white kids, junior high black kids, high school white kids, high school black kids, right? And these are the same spaces. And we know that because the, um, this space-based thing says that, that the friendship structure is gonna not be dominated by people who tend to be friends with each other, 
And so these tight clusters mean that there's a lot more ties within this group than there is from this group to any other group in the network. Okay. Now there is a third way of drawing networks that doesn't get quite as much attention, but you will see from time to time, which are a fixed coordinate layout. And you use this whenever you have a, an external coordinate space that is sensible for your nodes. And so the obvious case is geography. So if your nodes are linked in space and something about your question is space-based, in this case, it's hospital transfer networks. Um, so every hospital lives in a neighborhood and I can use their literal lat and long as a um, coordinate in the layout space. And you can see that people tend to transfer between hospitals that are near each other in, so in physical space. And so you can see that these little clusters tend to be in the same spot. And so if you're around um, Southern California, you tend to go to other hospitals in Southern California. If you're in Northern California, you go to other hospitals in Northern California. Now I can take a space-based layout or fixed coordinate layout and turn it into a force directed layout. And that's what you see over here on the right. And so you can see that all of the Southern California nodes and all of the Northern California nodes tend to be near each other. And it is the case that Southern California is near Northern California in this force-based space. But the overall social space of hospital transfers has this weird sort of I don't know, half moon shape centered around this black set of nodes, which happens to be the Chicago sort of you know, upper Midwest area, which is sort of a pass through, a big city pass through for these sets. And so you can see Texas is up over here. So the network is kind of upside down. Um, now you'll notice that one thing I've added to these models, which you're gonna see throughout the rest of these, these sort of first set of slides, is I've added a, a fit statistic. And what the fit statistic is, is the, if you were to correlate the physical distance on the screen with the geodesic distance using the graph, that's what that fit is. And so if your network perfect, perfectly reproduces your underlying social distance, then that correlation would be one. Um, it never is, um, but here it's strongly positive. And so the point that I'm making is that this is a better map, the one on the right, is a better map of the underlying social distance between these hospitals, but it's probably not a better communication tool to your audience, right? Because your audience recognizes where Maine is and where Florida is and where Washington is. And they can use that information to think about these colors, which in this case is um, uh, communities of hospitals that tend to share more often than not. Um, and so you often wanna think very carefully about whether or not um, whatever it is you're doing has a, you know, an underlying communicative property that your audience is gonna be able to buy into quickly. Um, Another kind of fixed coordinate layout is to use circles. Um, circles are the oldest layout algorithm in um, social network analysis, and people still use them. Uh, by and large, circles are pretty useless. Um, the reason they were originally used in early, early by hand network drawing is that with a circle, you can always tell when two lines are directly on top of each other because there will always be a slight angle between them. And so if you're trying to trace out by hand, who's connected to who, you never get the situation where one node is on a line to another node, but not connected to them. So it's a nice way if you're trying to do something by hand, but otherwise it's, it conveys, it essentially wastes all this spatial information. It doesn't ever send any of it out there. So this big circle is pretty useless. Um, one thing that I have had some luck with, and I think people sometimes get some benefit out of is if you take an under a, a basic space-based layout like this one, and then instead of using the raw connection here, you turn each cluster into its own circle, which is what this is. That gives you some sense of the comparative size of clusters and something like that. So I, I think that can be defensible and sometimes um, uh, help communicate stuff. Um, but by and large, circles are not particularly useful, which is why I hate chord diagrams. Um, for those of you that have like been bitten by the chord diagram bug in R because it's pretty and the colors are splashing makes a great t-shirt, um, but it doesn't really communicate a whole lot of information. So um, uh, anyway, you know, chord diagrams are the pie charts of social network analysis. And so I don't like them, um, but that's just me. Um, there are lots of other things you can do with the network analysis that I'm, I'm more, more than happy to go through and talk about some of these other sort of pits and pieces. Um, I, I wanna open it up for discussion. I wanna talk and just jump ahead to it, some other things. The vast majority of network analysis visualization is done by getting in there and playing with the points and lines version of it. 
this becomes a little less useful when you get really big or really dense networks. So this is an image of co-voting in the Senate. And um, what the beautiful insight that this gives you is that Republicans and Democrats vote differently. Right? And you didn't really need a, a network diagram to show you that. And um, that's true if it's a really dense network or if you have a network with a million nodes, it's gonna be impossible to do this. And so you often need to abstract from the underlying data a little bit. And so those kinds of point and line diagrams tend to not be as useful to those fashion sociograms as something like a heat matrix, which is what this is. And so here you can see, you know, Democrats and Republicans or maybe vice versa, depending on how this is at. Um, and that helps you see, well, where, like really, which of these nodes, this node right here has a lot of cross group connection who is that? And so that's the kind of thing you want to build to go in and look at. Um, the other thing I like to do to think about abstraction sometimes is if you really care about a process on the network as opposed to the network itself, like if I really care about disease diffusion um, and the thing, the reason I'm studying a network is because I want to understand disease diffusion, then it might be that simulating a little bit of disease diffusion over the network and then displaying how each node as a different start node would lead to a different diffusion curve uh, might be a better way to think about um, uh, exploring this network than it would be to visualize it itself. So that's what this is. We've just gone through and, and looked at a simple, um, uh, uh, perfect dis diffusion process over a network, and that then traces out the number of people each person can reach at each step. And that's just one way of thinking about the way these things work. Um, and I have some more examples of how you might do that as well. The final bit to point out is that sometimes your networks do things that um, are difficult to display statically. And this is where you get at things like what we call network movies. Um, sometimes the network movie is as this one, which is where the coordinate system is fixed but the relationships come and go. And these are romantic relationships amongst high school students um, uh, within the last six months. And you can see that most of their relationships don't last very long. And so they're right around the time we did the survey. And here at the end, you'll see them all disappear. It's not because everyone broke up after the school year ended, it's because we stopped collecting data, right? So that's just the kind of thing that you might wanna, might wanna play with. Um, I've also found that just doing a, this kind of flip book and ghosting idea as you go back and forth is kind of useful. So we had five years of data in Colorado Springs, and you can see when new people enter and old people leave where they fit in the overall cumulative structure. Um, by ghosting out the current year from the prior years. Um, again, just a, a way of doing that. Um, another way of looking at time is to try to force time into your two-dimensional space. And so this is what's been done here. This is, um, if I remember right, this is uh, one of the Prosper Ad Health data sets. Is that right? Yes, um, my eyes aren't good enough to see my screen anymore. Um, but you can see it was a, a, a single school at one point in time, and then it splits into two. And you can trace using identity arcs each kid and where they go over time. And that's just uh, another way to look at that. All right, so I'm gonna stop there. It's just to throw out, uh, my goal there was just to throw out a bunch of spaghetti and see what if it's hit to the wall in terms of opening it up for questions and comments just so that we can have a discussion about this. The, the real purpose of this is to think about this exploratory network analysis idea. And so the thing is that um, how do you go out and explore your network? The first way to do it is visualization. The second way to do it is to look at um, summary statistics. And I thought I had a difference. This is not the slide deck I thought I had. Interesting. All right. Um, well, that's too bad. OK. So I'm going to back up on that one. I saved the wrong one. Questions or comments? There is a question in the chat. Um, Thoughts on, it's from Paul, thoughts on visualizing complex weighted networks and thoughts on the necessity of doing this when simply using the network data in an analysis as opposed to focusing on the network. Yes, exactly. So there's a, um, one of the, the slide that I thought I had coming up here next was a, um, a, a slide where I did just that, where I uh, tried to look at the, um, uh, we use a scatter plot or something of, of uh, network statistics. I think that um, I'll, I'll answer the questions in, in order. The beauty of the space-based layout is that it does work really well with weighted networks. And so if you have a weighted network, um, usually as so long as you can tell the algorithm to treat the weights on the edges as, as, as stronger attraction forces. So if uh, Dana and I are connected at value two, 
and Tom and I are fixed at value one, then the strength, then the, the spring pulling me to Dana will be double the strength of the string pulling me to Tom, right? So that's the notion of what the, how the weights get incorporated. Um, most of the layout algorithms are, um, the really big difference in the weights is zero to something. And so if you have a complex weighted network that is where everybody has some weight to everybody else, even if it's a tiny weight and no weight to anyone and, and stronger weights to some people, those a whole lot of really tiny weights will add up to a big weight. And so the overall attraction of a tiny little bit of gravity to everybody in the network will end up creating almost always a completely uninterpretable hairball. And so if you have a network of somewhere in the order of you know, a few thousand nodes, not much bigger than that, um, then a point in line diagram of a heavily weighted network can work so long as you're willing to do what's called backboning. And backboning is a process of taking that full in by in adjacency matrix where everybody has some value to everyone else and lopping off some of those values. <laughs> and so the obvious question then is what values do you lop off and why? And there are three basic ways of doing it. The um, obvious one is to use um, some kind of a threshold model. So I'm only gonna take correlations greater than you know, 0.2 or something like this. And what I do when I'm, when I, as a rule of thumb, is I'll look at something like, you know, I'll cut it off at the top 10% or the top um, 5%, depending on what it is. To get a really clean network, um, an average degree um, uh, should be something on the order of like 5% of the nodes. And so if you have a network of 1,000 nodes, then people are tied to 50 others, you'll be all right. But if you have them tied to 500 others, then you're, it's, it's not going to work. So you want to, pick your threshold so that you essentially create a sparse matrix and then retain the values after that. Um, the other way to do it, so that the first one is thresholding. The second is to locally threshold. And so that's where you might take from each node its K highest um, uh, ties. And I do this a lot because the nice thing about doing that is that um, overall thresholding will often throw away, or will create a bunch of isolates for you and localizing it um, tends not to create as many isolates and let you situate weakly connected nodes next to usually the hub that they're um, already connected to. So if you're doing a text network and you have a series of terms that are related really, really locally to one network, so I do a lot of science network visualizations. And if you have one of your settings has to do with brain networks and then all the parts of the brain might be connected to that one hub, um, you don't want them all to all become isolates, but by locally um, uh, thresholding, they will all be connected to brain, say, and um, still be in, you know, carried with you. Um, that often cr creates a few asymmetries that you got to play with, but that's somewhat trivial. And the third version is to use a statistical model um, uh, to threshold or to backbone, in which you keep ties that are greater than you would expect by chance, where chance is defined by some kind of um, uh, you know, underlying model and either a, a statistical model of the network or what is more usually the case, just a row and column normalization issue. And so you take the, the, the chi-squared value effectively of whether or not this is there. You pick at a significantly larger edge. Um, and that those have been the ways that have been most successful um, that I've dealt with. There is one layout algorithm that's designed for complete valued network, and that's called the visualization of similarities layout. I'm on this and some, some uh, informatics folks have put together. Um, it's a version of MDS, multidimensional scaling, which is another way you could do this. I'm going to use multidimensional scaling. I've found that um, uh, it's, it's, it's my personal experience with it has not been great. It's um, it tends to lead to very sort of um, arcane shapes, but um, I would recommend trying it and seeing what's there um, because it is there. The, the other thing to keep in mind when you do a big weighted network like that is that you are going to threshold it. And again, I think that's fine. Um, that you have to do that in order to get some meaning out of the way it's otherwise a mess. Um, the only thing you have to do is make sure you tell the audience how you threshold it. And so just be clear in your write-up, um, uh, as an exploratory standpoint, that's you know, fine. You know what you did. You're just looking to see what's there. But, uh, but as an explore, exploration often ends up being exposition um, uh, before too long. And you just have to remember when you transition from exploration to exposition that you tell people what you did to get to that spot. Um, now, if your network is really, really big and it's one of these complex valued networks, then what I recommend doing is um, uh, creating what are called contour maps. And so you do the exact same thing. You actually let your algorithm generate the space-based layout, 
but you don't try to display all of the points and lines because all the points and lines themselves are pretty irrelevant. Instead, what you do is you fit a surface over the, over the two-dimensional space that your MDS or your um, uh, space-based layout would have generated and um, put a density graph there. And that's exactly what that very first um, slide I showed this morning of the field of um, social networks and health is that kind of a two-dimensional space layered over what is really a very large text network. Did that answer the question? I kind of went off on a, on a, on a rant there. So. I like that oh, you- uh, Please, right. Paul, go ahead. I said, I like that you told me to, to use a mapping technique on something that is uh, like, you know, mapped in space, but then contour mapping that I love it. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. And I think that the nice thing about a contour map is that it really does make it possible to see, like, like if you ask yourself, what do people get out of a visualization? And so something like this one, it so happens to be on the screen right in front of you. What you're gonna get out of it is there are four clumps in this network, right? And what you care about those clumps um, uh, is, is the thing. And that ends up being often being the case with really big networks is what you're trying to figure out is, you know, is it core periphery? Are there natural fissures? What do those fissures correlate with? And so you might imagine like um, taking a big spatial network like that, a big, you know, a, a contour map kind of, of piece, and then, you know, dropping in the map, well, where are the males? Where are the females? Where are the blacks? Where are the whites? Where are the um, uh, old people? Where are the young people? What have you? Um, and that will tell you something about exploring the network. Um, the other thing I do, just to be completely honest with really big networks that I'm trying to make sense of, especially when I'm first getting to know my data, is I will pull out two or three random nodes and just look at their ego networks, especially if, if I have a network of a million nodes, I'll pull out you know, an average degree node, a top 25 degree node, and a bottom 25 degree node, and just look at them and say, well, like, what am I seeing here? What gives me a tie? And if I see that, that like with the text network, that's one of the best ways to pick what your threshold value might be. If I look at two documents that are linked to each other um, by some amount of overlap, and I can tell that intuitively, because I know the field I'm working in or the field I'm studying, that those two networks are tied above my threshold, but they're really not substantively similar, then that means my threshold is too low. And so that's the kind of back and forth process you do exploring the data to figure out where to set those kinds of thresholds. Does that help? Yeah, that completely makes sense. I, I honestly, it, it sounds like about, it, it sounds a lot how I teach like mapping spatial geographic data. It, it's often a hypothesis generating procedure um, that's useful for providing context to the reader. Um, once you do, do move to that part of, of the presentation of the, of the results. So yeah. Right. That's great. And I think the other thing that people are a little afraid to do sometimes, and if you go through the full visualization slides, you'll see some links to some of these things that are there. One of the things that I love about um, a lot of the exploratory tools you can get right in there and actually move nodes around and look at them. And so some of these interactive visualizations are nice that way, particularly for the exploratory part where you're just trying to learn what your data are. And I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to know your data well. And so it, you're, there's, this, there's this temptation there, there. I think there are two modern temptations that have come out of um, sort of the routinization of statistical research in social science. Um, the first is that um, like there's something about what the computer does that is sacrosanct, that if the layout that, they, that it gives me looks like something on the screen, that I'm somehow lying if I change it. Um, you're not, um, because remember, every layout that you see out there is a heuristic. It's a, it, it would be, for those of you that know geography, it'd be like using one map projection versus another. If you really want to be true, you have to have a globe in front of you and you have to hand everybody a 3D object, right? And you're not going to do that. And so, um, so you're going to distort reality to put a globe in two dimensions or you're going to distort an n-dimensional, an n-minus-one-dimensional network object by putting it into two dimensions and you're going to distort it pretty dramatically. And so it's okay with given that distortion to say, you know what, I need to move Alaska I'm a little bit closer and Hawaii wouldn't even be on the screen if I didn't put it over there and that's fine, right? So long as what you're doing is, is obvious to people and you point out that, you know, we used a fukuman rheingold algorithm to do this layout. And then um, uh, within each cluster, we ran a second algorithm to make a look a little to, um, to you know, to jitter, jitter, jitter the nodes so they weren't overlapping or something. 
or you know, I took all the really long fuzz bits on the edge and just pulled them in, right? And you can just say, I, I adjusted by hand for clarity. That's perfectly reasonable. Um, uh, the other thing that people are often um, interested in doing with exploratory network analysis are, and is to do 3D visualizations um, uh, where you say, well, you know, and it seems obvious, right? That two dimensions fits poorly, three dimensions will fit better because you get an entire different set. And that is absolutely true. Um, and it's also the case that in print, it's almost always useless. And so 3D visualizations are great to help you get some intuition because you can sometimes see where clusters are on top of each other and you can get in there and you can move it around and look at it. Um, but I rarely had any success printing and handing out um, for others to look at a 3D visualization. I mean, unless you gave them little goggles or something to look at, it's just hard to, it's hard to make that work. There was another question that came up about statistical analysis and using that to um, do your exploratory analysis. And again, the answer there is yes. Um, I strongly recommend, um, and in fact, the, the package that we're developing that I hinted at a minute, a minute um, in the last session, um, part of what we're doing in that package is generating a set, a set of baseline scores um, uh, that are just automatically generated for every network that's loaded. Um, and that lets you look at things like the degree distribution the centralization distribution, the correlation between um, each node's degrees and their pairs degrees, which is called the assortativityness of the network. These are things that um, have a very strong constraining feature to the structure of the network. Um, similarly, you wanna look at just scatter plots of core dependent variables that you care about um, by the network measured. So is it the case that centrality is correlated with happiness or income or whatever it is you're trying to measure, self-rated health? Um, it's perfectly reasonable to do those kinds of things. And you usually learn a lot. Um, so I strongly recommend that. And the one thing you also want to do is make sure that um, uh, make sure that you don't have stupid mistakes in the data, especially when you, like, as you saw like last session, it's really easy when you're moving bits of our objects around to try to coerce them into a network object to grab the wrong one or to grab um, a piece that you didn't want or something. And so if you do that kind of just simple degree distribution and notice that you know half of your nodes are isolated and you know that that's not true in reality, then you have a mistake somewhere. If you have one node that's connected to almost every other node, then you want to make sure that's really true. And so going through and do some of that thing that there's a you know it's a blurred line between data cleaning and data exploration, but I think they feed back on each other. And so you want to you, you definitely want to do that. There's one more question. We are over time right now, but one question from Shannon Ford is thoughts on using diffusion curves for exploring phenotypes. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by phenotypes. Could you elaborate just a bit? Sure. You know, and that's one of my big troubles with, I think a lot of times uh, sociology is such a wonderful thing about looking at things as holes and then maybe in other domains, we think of it as parts. So if you have somebody who is experiencing this types of symptoms or these, these number of symptoms, um, and then all of a sudden they morph into something else, uh, is there a way to say, okay, well, this seems to be the trajectory path uh, that lands you here and therefore is this type of phenotype uh, of, of the individual? Yeah, there's a fun, there's a fun, I don't know, I, we should talk offline about this in more detail because it's, a, it's an interesting question. There is a nice little trick that I've seen um, to uh, essentially visualize Markov matrices um, where you treat, and for those of you that don't know, Markov models are a, a probability distribution and where you expect with a given input, you should end up with a given output with a, with a flow model through a state space. Um, so a flow, a flow model through a state space is a weighted network. And so you can imagine like if I enter this network at row X, what's the likelihood that I end at row Y? Um, that's the way that a, a state space kind of model would work. And so you can do those sorts of pieces and ask whether or not where I enter affects where I exit. Um, and that might be a way to think about those kinds of things. All right, so we are over time. Um, let's go ahead and, and just take a, a well, let's start, let's take a five minute break anyway, <laughs> and then I'm gonna come back and we'll probably blend the next two pieces for statistical models and ego networks um, because they do blend directly into each other pretty strongly. So let's come back at, um, uh, at 12.50 instead of 12.45 and we'll talk about statistical models and networks.